Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LM News special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for fa past five years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the U.S. and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, and student scholarships, special lectures, and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country awarded the prestigious Center for International Business Education grants from the U.S. Department of Education. The Center for International Business Education serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business pr practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacity. Today, our webinar will cover a very important and timely topic, which serves our mission and has great implications not only for companies operating in the auto industry in Asia, but also all the companies who are seeking for a successful electrification strategy. Along with Samsung, Hyundai represents one of the two largest conglomerates, so-called Chebol in Korea. The name Hyundai means modern times or the modern era in Korean. The founder of Hyundai Group, late Mr. Jung Ju Young, is considered one of the most respected entrepreneurs in Korea. Hyundai Motor is the mainstay of Hyundai Group. Despite an adverse impact of the COVID-19 and the ensuing global chip supply chain disruption, it has become a global leader in EVs and the world number three automaker in terms of sales volume. Hyundai Motor is also trying to secure its business sustainability as a mobility solutions provider through advanced technologies of not only hardware, but also software. We are very fortunate today to have the panelists from Hyundai Motor North America, who will present the current state of electrification and role of emerging technology for a more sustainable and equitable future. Before we start the program, let me introduce our moderator, Mr. Ed Kim. As a well-known automotive industry expert with over 20 years, Ed is currently president and chief analyst at Auto Pacific, which is an automotive marketing research and product consulting company. He has developed one of the most accurate prediction of the auto industry's future through both the competitive battleground and sales focused service products. Prior to joining Auto, auto Pacific, Ed served as a manager in Hyundai Motor America's advanced product development and strategy department. In this role, he used his background in psychology and sociology to increase company focus on future consumer needs-based product concept development. Ed has also worked as an automotive journalist, writing for several major automotive publications, and his work is regularly quoted in the press and frequently appeared on national news programs. Ed, thanks for joining us today. Could you please introduce our panelists? Thank you very much, Professor, um, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you for having me here, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, to uh, today's session. Very excited to be here. Um, we have a very exciting uh, uh, discussion today, and at the heart of this discussion are two of Hyundai Motor North America's uh, finest and brightest and future-oriented minds. So I'd like to introduce them here. Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kristen Gomez. Uh, Kristen is uh, Senior Group Manager of Regulatory Strategy and Eco-Mobility at Hyundai Motor North America. Uh, she is the Senior Group Manager, uh, uh, Senior Group Manager, oh, sorry, I already said that. She's responsible for regulatory analysis, strategy development, and advocacy to support Hyundai's zero emission vehicle goals. She's also responsible for managing and growing Hyundai's Evolve Plus EV pilot subscription service. Before she joined Hyundai in 2020, 
Uh, Gomez served as regulatory counsel at Honda North America, where she advised on emissions, fuel economy, and vehicle safety related regulations. Um, she draws on 15 plus years of environmental law and policy experience working with the US EPA, the state of California, and also in private practice. Her experience spans uh, both federal and state laws related to air quality, climate change, water management, land use, and endangered species, among others. Gomez graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a Bachelor of Arts uh, degree in political science and a Bachelor of Science degree in conservation and resource studies. She obtained her Doctor of Law at the University of California, Irvine. In 2022, Gomez was named Woman of the Year by the National Hispanic Business Women's Association for her contribution to corporate responsibility. I'd also like to introduce Gilbert Castillo. Uh, uh, Gilbert is the Senior Group Manager of Product Strategy and Regulatory Compliance at Hyundai Motor North America. He's responsible for the company's exploration into new vehicle segments including those with alternative powertrain technologies. He is also responsible for strategic planning for the company's future line of vehicles in the United States. Castillo led the successful introduction and launch of the Hyundai Tucson fuel cell vehicle, which was the first production fuel cell vehicle sold in the United States. Castillo joined Hyundai in 2012 from Honda R&D Americas, where he worked in the areas of vehicle research and design and strategic vehicle development. Prior to joining Honda, he also worked for Toyota Motor Corporation in Japan. Castillo graduated from Stanford University and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in product design engineering. He's married and has two children. Castillo can often be found on weekends driving, both for work and pleasure, on the back roads of Southern California in a variety of vehicles, including his classic Alfa Romeo Spider. So with that, um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to turn the presentation uh, over to uh, over to both of them. Uh, this is a very, very, uh, very, very timely and uh, very, very interesting topic. Uh, Hyundai uh, has really, truly been at the forefront of the huge changes happening in our industry. Uh, everything from how we propel our vehicles to really just what it, what uh, uh, transportation is. And with Hyundai's uh, ongoing trans uh, transformation into more than just a car company, but a mobility provider. Uh, this is going to be a very, very interesting uh, topic uh, to hear uh, to, to hear from the two of them. So, with that, I'd like to hand it over um, to our fine folks from Hyundai Motor North America. Great, thank you, Ed. Uh, thank thanks you, for, Ed. for the remarks, and thank you to LME for having us. We're really excited to be able to present and have a, an open dialogue about you know, some of Hyundai's uh, efforts in the electrification and sustainability uh, field. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. Okay, so we can just go ahead and go to the next page. So I'm gonna start off by talking about our North Star um, or their vision that Hyundai has set for its future. And, and we actually call it progress for humanity. Uh, as we know, humanity unites us and it makes us stronger. But when humanity works together, it actually can solve really critical global problems. And so for Hyundai Progress for Humanity, it's about enabling humanity to accelerate this progress and thereby become a company that society wants really to exist. Now, as society quickly evolves, we too have to change to meet society's or humanity's future needs. And so for us, this means transforming for what we call a legacy automotive or automobile manufacturer into a more of a smart mobility solutions provider, which is a catchy phrase and you know something I think you've been hearing a lot about. So what exactly does that mean? Well, for us, there's two components to, to being a smart mobility solution provider. The first component is uh, about enabling change through electrification. So it's about moving away from fossil fuels as a direct power source um, and into an era of more environmentally friendly and economical mobility through electrification. So um, undoubtedly, many companies are moving in this general direction. But for Hyundai, we have to ensure that it's done in such a way that uh, all humanity can uh, make this transition and not only just a select few. The second component is about expanding our business beyond conventional transportation and into uh, different smart mobility areas. So the obvious areas I think that when people think about when you think smart mobility is something like ride sharing or ride hailing, but it's actually a lot more than that. 
It's also about finding solutions for like the first and last mile right before you get into your car and after you leave your car. It's also about mobility that doesn't necessarily take place on the road. Think about mobility in the air, on rail, overseas. Um, it's also about uh, autonomy and connectivity, right? And the conveniences and the safety aspects which that uh, autonomy and connectivity bring about. And it's even about uh, different vehicle ownership and rental models, right? Think about subscriptions, um, things like that, which we're gonna be touching upon. So progress in these areas, we think, will help us become a, a company that people want to prosper because we'll be able to contribute positively uh, to their lives. And ultimately that's, that's our goal in, in progress for humanity. So we can move on to the next page. So today's consumer expects a lot. And just because they may be interested in an environmentally friendly vehicle does not by any means mean that they're willing to sacrifice things like comfort, performance, safety, entertainment features, et cetera, right? And at the same time, we have to remember that no two consumers are alike. Every car buyer has a unique set of needs, of wants, priorities, the way they use a vehicle, and maybe most importantly, purchasing power, their ability to purchase a vehicle. Um, another thing we have to consider is that Hyundai is a global company and the needs of American buyers are very different from the needs of maybe Korean buyers, European buyers, um, Chinese buyers, right? Uh, countries are in different stages of electrification in terms of what the country can support, what the buyers want, and what they themselves can, can um, live with. So it's for these reasons that we can't assume that a single solution um, is sufficient and that consumers will simply adjust the ownership or their behavior to meet that simple solution or single solution. Instead, we have to meet consumers where they're at. Um, and for Hyundai, uh, for us, we've embraced that challenge. And it's the reason why we're one of the few car manufacturers that actually offers a range of electrified solutions. Now, it includes hybrids, of course, and plug-in hybrids. It also includes pure battery electric vehicles, but it also includes uh, fuel cell electric models. In fact, by 2025, the Hyundai Motor Group plans to sell 1 million electrified vehicles per year worldwide. Now, I think most people here are familiar or should be familiar with what hybrid is, a plug-in hybrid, and of course, a pure battery electric. But I want to talk a little bit more about fuel cell because it's actually a technology that's been around for many years, but few people actually know exactly what it is. So let me go to the next slide. So a fuel cell actually generates its own electricity as opposed to storing the electricity on board using batteries. A hydrogen fuel cell combines hydrogen and oxygen uh, to generate electricity using an electrochemical process. The byproduct of this process is actually water, hydrogen, oxygen, H2O. So the hydrogen is actually stored on board using pressurized tanks that you can refill at hydrogen stations. Uh, and you may be surprised to know that there are actually about 60 hydrogen stations here in California. One of the key advantages of a hydrogen fuel cell is that it refuels just as quickly as you would fuel a gas in a powered car, about five minutes to refuel. Um, so the question is, of course, why offer a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle when you have battery electric fuel cell or battery electric uh, vehicles. The, the simple reason is that, again, no two consumers are alike. We have to understand and recognize the fact that some consumers are not able to charge at home, uh, be it because maybe they park on the street or they don't have a dedicated parking spot because they live in a high rise. Uh, or perhaps for them, public charging is not convenient uh, or they need to be able to fill uh, quickly, right? So if we were only trying to capture, I don't know, 67, 80% of the market, perhaps we could do it just with battery electrics. But if we really want to transition 100% of the, of the buying public, then we have to offer more than one solution. And for these, some of these buyers, a fuel cell electric vehicle may be the only viable solution for them. Now, another key advantage of fuel cell vehicles is scalability. Using a fuel cell in a larger vehicle simply requires uh, using a larger fuel cell stack, much in the same way as you would just increase like the displacement of a gasoline or diesel vehicle as you put it into a bigger vehicle. And this is one area where battery electric vehicles are at a key disadvantage due largely to the battery's low energy density. The larger the vehicle, the more batteries you need. Batteries are heavy, so that impacts the driving range. So that increase or improve the driving range, you have to add more batteries, and so it's diminishing returns. So Hyundai currently sells the Nexo hydrogen fuel cell vehicle globally, uh, and including here in California since 2019. At the other end of the spectrum, we also sell the Axiant heavy duty truck, which is actually already available in Europe. And there are about 200 or so units running around in Switzerland. And we're actually about to launch a demonstration program here uh, in Northern California with the state of California and the Port of Oakland. Um, these, these vehicles, these heavy duty trucks will be used as drage trucks to carry 
container uh, containers from the port to distribution centers um, further inland. But let me get back to battery electrics. So let's go back to the next page. So Hyundai Motor is actually targeting targeting 7% of global EV market penetration by 2030. Now, in order to accomplish this task, Hyundai is in the midst of a huge battery electric onslaught that includes, that will include 17 new battery electric models, 11 for Hyundai and six for the Genesis luxury brand by 2030. One key thing to understand is that our Genesis luxury brand will actually become 100% battery electric uh, vehicle brand by 2030. Now, these are very ambitious targets. And one of the things that you should be asking yourselves is, who is actually gonna purchase all these vehicles, these EV vehicles? Is the market ready? Outside of California, um, EV uh, change or EV growth is much lower, right? Than it is here on the West Coast. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, let's go to the next slide. So on the one hand, I think that everyone here has heard you know, uh, survey results indicating that consumers are showing great interest in buying a battery electric vehicle. And uh, data that we use also suggests that consumers are indeed more generally more interested or at least considering an electric car for the next purchase. Um, the data here, you can see that it's gone from 19% in 2016 for people saying that they would definitely or probably consider purchasing an electric car up to 37% for this year. But one thing that we have to remember is that saying that you're going to be, saying that you're interested in buying an electric car and actually doing it, there's a huge difference between the two. And what we find is that the majority of these respondents are actually not very informed when it comes to what a battery electric is, uh, is what it does and what it can't do. Uh, and in fact, when you talk about, you know, what actual driving ranges are, charge times, vehicle prices, things like that, you find that a lot of these consumers who said they were interested in purchasing an electric car suddenly that, that um, consideration drops significantly, drops maybe from 30% down to 10%. And so by saying that I'm not indicating or trying to say that the, the U.S. market or U.S. consumer is not ready for electrification, I certainly think that they are. And I think that we're seeing that upward trajectory in terms of uh, actual EVs being purchased growing significantly. But what I'm trying to say here is that there's a lot of education that still has to take place uh, by the manufacturers, by the companies such as our own, also by uh, state and federal government. Um, but it also means that uh, we have to improve the electric vehicles that we do uh, sell um, to meet these expectations, right? Ultimately, like I said, it's about meeting the consumer where they're at. Um, and that leads me to the next slide. So what are we doing to meet these consumer expectations? So hopefully, I think everyone is aware of the Ionic 5 crossover that we launched last year. It's our first dedicated battery electric vehicle. And when we actually dedicated, it means that it's built on a platform um, that only serves for electric vehicles. Uh, and what that does is it enables us to optimize the platform for some of the unique advantages that an electrified or electric vehicle uh, provides. Um, and it also allows us to address some of the shortcomings of previous generation EVs. So the Ionic 5 is a crossover uh, that sets kind of a new standard for Hyundai and also the EV industry as a whole. And it's received uh, significant uh, market recognition as a result. It's one World Car of the Year, uh, it's worn EV um, SUV of the Year, from I think Car Driver EV of the Year, um, Motor Trend, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it certainly has won a lot of awards and the market recognizes it as, as a vehicle that minimizes a lot of the constraints or, or a lot of the issues that they had before uh, through excellent driving range, uh, over 300 miles, so very quick charging times, uh, the Ionic 5, actually can charge zero to 80% or 10 to, 10 to 80% in 18 minutes. Um, and then of course, it's a vehicle that's available for the masses. It's not priced at a high premiums as say some of our uh, luxury competitors, but it's also just the beginning. So let's go to the next place. So the Ionic 5 is uh, the first of one of three Ionic models that's actually coming uh, to the market in the very, very near future. Um, it's using this platform that we call the Electric Global Modular Platform, or the EGMP. Um, and we're able to offer with this platform a range of solutions. So very early next year, you're going to see the launch of the Onyx 6, which is a sedan. In fact, you've probably already seen pictures of it. Um, we're actually going to show it at the LA Auto Show if you're going to be there. Um, and then that vehicle will be followed by the Onyx 7, which is actually going to be a large three-row SUV. Um, you know, up until now, most of the EVs that you've seen in the marketplace tend to be smaller. Um, 
you know, the Ionic is actually on, on the larger side, but the Ionic 7 is going to be significantly larger and it's going to meet families, uh, the needs that families have in terms of interior passenger cargo space, all while delivering excellent range um, and kind of the kind of the benefits of the of the Hyundai EGMP platform. But there's actually a lot more. Uh, and that's kind of where I want to show you next. So there you go. So on this page, it's it's kind of a busy page, but here you can see that the both Hyundai and Genesis brands were rapidly introducing a range of new electrified models, especially the pure battery electrics. So you see the blue, the pure battery electrics, the light green, the plug-in hybrids, and then the dark green is the fuel cell. Um, and I'm not even showing you the hybrids, which of which there are a number of more vehicles. But you can see here that uh, over the next couple of years, we're, we've recently introduced or will introduce uh, a, a number of EV models. Uh, this includes Genesis models like the recently introduced uh, G80 Electrified, soon to be introduced G70 uh, Small Crossover Electrified. Um, and then, like I said, the Ionic uh, 6 and 7. Now, this only goes to 2025. And unfortunately, I can't really show you uh, what the next period, which is 2026 to 30, uh, entails. But I can assure you that uh, there's a full onslaught of additional uh, pure battery electric models and other electrified models coming. Remember, Genesis is actually going to be a pure electric brand by 2030. So a lot of vehicles that we have currently in our lineup will start that transition to pure electric in this time frame. But it's not just about cars, right? Sustainability and, uh, and moving towards an electrified future. This cars or vehicles are just one part of it. They're, like I said, mobility is much more than just the vehicles you see on the road. And so for that, I'm going to turn over to Kristen, who's going to go over some of the other areas that we're exploring. Thank you, Gail. I think we can move to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'm um, very happy to be with you today. Uh, here, I wanted, we're making the transition into some of our innovative uh, projects that we're working on that really supports a carbon neutral lifestyle. So here on this slide, you can see Hyundai Home. Um, it's another way we're making it easy for customers to adopt Hyundai EVs into their lives. It's a home energy ecosystem comprised of home level two chargers, residential rooftop solar panels, and energy storage systems, as well as a professional installation service um, to accommodate these uh, customers, all available through a one-stop shop online marketplace. We announced Hyundai Home last year at Auto Mobility LA, and it will be launching very, very soon. We can now move to the next slide. Thank you very much. So um, as we said at the outset in the introductions, um, I am I'm one of the co-leads on this program. This is actually a Hyundai Capital program, but Hyundai Motor is very um, supportive and aligned with this program. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about Evolve Plus. And what Gil has said um, throughout is that we really try to meet the customers where they are. Um, and so you are likely very familiar with um, the myriad subscription services that are out there available to you through Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. Um, considering this trend, we created Evolve Plus, which is a new way to experience the EV lifestyle without the high cost and commitment of a long-term lease or vehicle purchase. I like to think of it as an EV uh, consumer education tool um, or a 28-day um, uh, trial period um, or test drive. And so it's a no commitment 28 day sub subscription service uh, you can use to see if an EV is right for you. Um, so you pay, you know, a $28, we call it monthly shorthand, but it's really a 28 uh, day term. And you pay for basically this extended test drive to understand how an EV um, will fit into your lifestyle. Where's your local charging stations on your way to work, et cetera. Um, and to understand how seamless the transition really can be for you. Um, it's a great option also when you have a gap in your transportation needs. For instance, if you need a vehicle for a few months or less than a year, you can also use this program for that particular need. Um, the membership uh, includes insurance, maintenance, and roadside assistance to help support you have a uh, a seamless process. If, if anything goes sideways, we're here to support that, um, all for um, a fee, a 28-day fee, and it's currently available in six states. We uh, started the pilot last year. Um, we hope to get to California soon. We're not here yet, 
um, but we're looking to hopefully enter that market next year. Next slide, please. And of course, there's more Hyundai is working on. So Pernal is our air mobility company, which is developing electrical vertical takeoff and landing solutions. Um, Hyundai also recently purchased Boston, Boston Dynamics, the company known for their robot dogs. Um, why? Well, robotics play an important role in next generation smart factories, but robotic technologies can also help people with compromised mobility. Hyundai has also partnered with Motional, a leader in autonomous vehicle development. And Motional will be deploying autonomous Ionic 5s in various cities as early as next year. And then there is New Horizon Studio, a Hyundai organization based in Montana of all places, working on what they call extreme mobility vehicles. Think walking cars that can go upstairs or meet you at your door. Next slide, please. In the beginning of the pre presentation, we mentioned that Americans think that, business, um, that businesses should do their part in preserving the environment. And that couldn't be more true for Hyundai. We believe in preserving the environment. Um, and that's why we committed, uh, we made a, a public commitment last year to achieve carbon neutrality in our products and global, global operations by 2045. So how do we get there? Next slide, please. The short answer is investing in electrification. Hyundai Motor Group, which includes both Hyundai Motor Company and the Kia Corporation, has committed to investing $10 billion in the US by 2025 to produce future EVs, enhance existing production facilities, and further our investments in sustainable smart mobility solutions. Hyundai invested 300 million and created 200 new jobs in conjunction with this expansion at Hyundai Motor Manufacturing in Alabama which we call HMMA. As a result, HMMA began building the Santa Fe Hybrid this month and will build the all-electric Genesis, Genesis GV70 SUV in December of this year. This is for our current manufacturing plans, but we have bigger plans too. Next slide, please. Part of our strategy and commitment includes a $5.5 billion uh, investment for a new EV and battery manufacturing facility in Georgia. This is the biggest economic development project in Georgia's history. This all new plant will serve as Hyundai's first dedicated US EV and battery manufacturing facility and will break ground this month and is expected to begin commercial production in the first half of 2025 calendar year, creating more than 8,000 jobs and it will have an annual capacity of 300,000 EV units. As part of Hyundai Motor Group's commitment to sustainability, the plant will mainly rely on renewable energy sources to power the facility and use emission reduction technologies in accordance with the RE100 initiative, which is a commitment to source your energy renewably 100%. That wraps up our presentation and we're really happy to take your questions. Thank you for your time and hearing Hyundai's vision of progress for humanity. All right, thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Gil. Um, that, was, uh, that was excellent, that was fascinating. And um, well, it leaves you with a lot of questions. So I hope you're, uh, I hope you're ready for some questions. Um, so um, during, this, uh, during this point of our session, um, I'll, I've got a few questions to ask uh, Kristen and Gil, and then uh, we'll open it up to um, uh, to audience questions. So you can uh, just type your uh, type your questions into the Q and A, uh, and we'll get to those in just a little bit. Um, so uh, let's see. First question. So uh, Kristen, you talked about uh, Hyundai becoming a smart mobility solution provider uh, rather than just an automaker. I mean, you know, during, uh, you know, I've always thought of Hyundai as an automaker and certainly during the years that I worked there, uh, we were a car company, um, but now there's bigger plans. Um, so how will you go about entering and leading in areas like aviation or robotics? These are industries that Hyundai traditionally doesn't have a whole lot of experience in. So uh, how are you going to, how are you going to go about uh, gaining a leadership position in those areas. 
Thank you for that question, Ed. Um, and of course, I welcome um, any input here from Gil. But I guess I would say one thing that um, I have learned in my time at Hyundai is that we are very innovative. And we know when we need to bring in folks uh, to help us spearhead things that we've maybe not done before. And that makes us nimble. And so in trying to um, advance mobility beyond what our kind of our core business has always been, we look to, um, to being open to developing our workforce in that way. Um, and so I would say that there is a lot of coordination internally about how we do that. And then we set up these other businesses or I guess subsidiaries to help develop that talent. Um, but it is very important for us to be able to lead in all of those spaces that you've identified. I would, I would also welcome any comments from Gil. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you, Kristen. So yeah, I, I echo what Kristen just said. Uh, Hyundai is a relatively young automotive company. Uh, it only started sales here in the U.S. in the 1980s, I believe. Um, but it's now become one of the leading uh, car companies in the U.S. in terms of quality, design, um, and, um, reliability, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Hyundai certainly is a company that can learn very quickly. Um, but to more closely answer the question, I think it comes down to one, leadership. So leadership at Hyundai has kind of set out goals to that basically are ensuring that the company venture out and look at other areas of mobility beyond just on road. Um, I think it's important uh, once you have the support of leadership and an understanding from leadership of the importance of these other uh, avenues, um, that certainly goes a long way. Uh, and then another thing that Hyundai is not afraid to do is to go outside of its own kind of area of influence. So one of the reasons why it acquired Boston Dynamics is because Boston Dynamics is an expert in robotics, right? And so we can learn a lot from what they're doing and how can we integrate their findings and their learnings into our own systems. So this is why we've established another, a number of different companies, right, like uh, Motional and such, or partnering with companies like Motional, right, where uh, we may not be the experts, but we, we know that certain other companies are. And so how can we uh, jointly uh, benefit from our expertise and their expertise to, to uh, progress uh, jointly? Okay, well, th uh, thank you both very much, um, Gil. I have a I have a question for you. Um, uh, you talked a, you talked a little bit about hydrogen fuel cells um, earlier in the presentation. Now, right now, the industry seems to be very focused on battery electric vehicles today, and obviously, Hyundai is a you know, major major participant in that. Um, but of course, you know, you're doing a lot of work on uh, hydrogen fuel cell powertrains. Um, interestingly, for both light vehicles as well as heavy vehicles, uh, you've got the Nexo. You were, the, as you pointed out, you were, uh, Hyundai was the first uh, with a uh, with a retail uh, fuel cell vehicle with the Tucson FCV. Um, but but also now you're doing a, uh, doing a lot of trials with heavy uh, hydrogen vehicles. In your opinion, do light or heavy vehicles have more potential for hydrogen? Sorry, Gil. No. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a it's a question worth exploring because I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings in terms of is it a battery electric or hydrogen, either or. When in reality, it's about both. Um, clearly, battery electric, at least in terms of light duty, has a significant um, uh, lead when it comes to sales. And for the most part, I think we would say that. Uh, majority of consumers would probably uh, be, uh, can probably meet their needs with a battery electric vehicle. Um, like I indicated previously, not 100%, but we do certainly think the majority can. Um, that's not necessarily the case for heavy duty. Um, there are going to be uh, medium duty and heavy duty vehicles that are driven in short range, right? Maybe it's this last mile uh, type um, transport for package delivery, right? Those certainly can be done with battery electric. But when you get into more intermediate distance or when you get into uh, uh, long distance heavy uh, hauling, uh, then that becomes significantly more difficult with battery electric. Um, so I think that's one area that has a lot more potential right now uh, for significant growth. And I think we've seen that uh, not only uh, among manufacturers, but also with the government. So the government is, uh, EPA is launching this hydrogen hubs, a program, right, where they're trying to grow interest in hydrogen 
uh, ecosystem, not just in California, but in different parts of the, of the country. Um, and it's really focused around heavy duty, right? Where it's difficult to uh, transition away from diesel. Okay, now I do have a follow-up question to that, which is, uh, you know, right now, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of development of uh, battery electric vehicle charging infrastructure. That's that's obviously been, uh, you know, a major area of development over the last few years. Uh, but in comparison, we've seen very little um, uh, hydrogen fueling infrastructure. Um, and in order for hydrogen to become uh, a lot more prominent than it is today and and, uh, become, and get a lot more into the mainstream, um, it's gonna, that infrastructure needs to grow greatly. Uh, what does Hyundai see as its role in helping to develop a hydrogen fueling infrastructure? So we actually work very closely with the uh, station developers. Uh, we actually have a partnership with Shell as they're developing 50 or so stations here in the state of California. Um, so a lot of it has to do with working closely with the developers uh, so they can understand where are the best locations to place hydrogen stations. You know, what is the potential feature demand for these hydrogen stations? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, a lot of the interest and growth is shifted, like I said, towards heavy duty. Um, and in many ways, heavy duty can act as a seed. So for heavy duty, you don't need to have as many stations because the routes that a heavy duty truck may take are uh, not as broad, right? You, you definitely have a uh, general zone where they go to and where they come from, distribution center, distribution center, for example. And so it actually is uh, not as complicated to develop a hydrogen fueling network for heavy duty. And you can use that as a starting point for then light duty. Because once you've established the heavy duty station, then you can also use that for light duty. But more importantly, now you've established a hub that you can then branch out right with light duty. But yeah, for sure, um, the hydrogen station rollout has been much, much lower than I think we would have liked. Um, a lot of it has to do just uh, with the cost involved for developing a hydrogen station. There's also a lot of relation. A lot of it has to be has to do with it took a long time for local districts to understand what a hydrogen station really entail. Um, and as we try and go beyond California, you have to replicate that, right? You have to teach local communities, local leaders, local fire districts, et cetera, on what a hydrogen station is and what it's not and how safe it is. Um, now that takes time. But once you do have a hydrogen station, again, one of the key advantages is that one single hydrogen station can support thousands of vehicles depending on the size of that station. Whereas, you know, to be able to replicate that with electricity or that battery public charging, then you can't do that with just one. You have to, to develop many, many to be able to support that number of vehicles. But um, it is growing, but certainly not at the pace that we would like. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Kristen, you talked about Hyundai Home. That's, uh, and that's something that's of a great interest to me because, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, with electric vehicles, with battery electric vehicles, um, you know, the home itself becomes an integral part of the charging infrastructure. Um, is Hyundai Home with Hyundai Chargers and solar power, is that available right now? And uh, whether it's available now or later, how would I go about getting more information about that? It's a really great, great question, Ed, and it's a really exciting product. Um, so Hyundai Home will enable customers to secure not only chargers and home solar, but also home energy storage as well. We're working with third parties to deliver an exceptional customer experience that will offer leading warranties and customer value while making the entire home electrification process more streamlined and user-friendly. Hyundai Home will be available very soon um, and we'll ma be making an announcement on the status of Hyundai Home later this month. So stay tuned. Okay, awesome. Um, I also have a question about Evolve Plus. Um, that is also, the whole idea of vehicle subscriptions has been very interesting to me. Now, it, hasn't, it doesn't seem to have really, really taken off yet with consumers, but the idea is interesting because, um, you know, as you point out, uh, you know, we don't really, there are so many things we don't buy anymore. You know, we subscribe to things now. We subscribe to Netflix. We subscribe to Spotify for our music. Um, you know, we even uh, subscribe to certain, uh, you know, home deliveries of, you know, you know, regular use items, you know, from Amazon. So um, the idea of subscribing to a vehicle, I, I mean, I, I feel like there's something there. Um, but even though a few automakers have tried it in the last few years, hasn't really resonated with consumers yet. Um, do you have any early uh, studies to show how much interest there is in Evolve Plus? Um, and as a secondary question, how do you think Evolve Plus uh, may succeed where other subscription services haven't yet? 
Yeah, also a great question. Well, I admit I am biased because um, I lead this program on the Hyundai Motor side, um, but I uh, we see a lot of potential here. So let me just give a little bit of background. Uh, we launched our pilot program uh, last year, a, a little bit more than a year ago. I think I may have mentioned that um, during the presentation. We launched it with a single dealer. Over the course of a year, we grew to eight dealers across six states. Um, we grow. We we were growing the program as we were as we were working through refinements of the program, um, finding out what the customers really wanted and needed from us, um, and so that growth over that period of time reflected all of those very early learnings. We're now in Oregon, Colorado, Massachusetts, New Mexico, or New Jersey, excuse me, Maryland, and South Carolina. Um, our early learnings demonstrated um, consumer interest in this type of program. Um, we got consumers that were in specifically to learn about EV technology, and we also got consumers in um, who were trying to fill their transportation gap needs. Um, so who maybe renewed their subscription for multiple months. Some of them purchased a vehicle with the dealer that they subscribed from. Others did not. Maybe they were here for a short period of time. We did see that um, happen. And so there were a lot of learnings that I think from the outset we couldn't necessarily anticipate. Some were, were foreseeable, but others were not. So it was a great learning experience, I think, for the company. Um, and we, we also know that with gas prices, every time there's a gas price spike, um, just people flock to EVs, right? Um, and, and so that this pilot kind of coincided with some higher gas prices. Um, and we think that that may be indicative of kind of the future trends of how this is going. Um, in terms of what sets Evolve Plus apart, at a high level, I would say it's threefold. The first is um, we have a really exciting product leading this subscription service. Our Ionic 5 is available in this program and it is the leading product. We also offer our Kona EV um, and that is sort of an entry point for customers who want to try out the EVs. The Ionic 5 is priced a little bit higher, um, but it's still relatively affordable. So let me talk about price competitiveness. Um, our pricing uh, for this program for 28 days, and again, it's all inclusive of um, insurance, maintenance, roadside assistance, $699. Um, that's for our Kona EV. For the Ionic 5, um, it's as low as $899. Um, and the flexibility here is, is really key to the program. That's a competitive advantage that we have um, because our terms compared to other um, subscription services, whether it's through an OEM or a non-OEM provider, um, have they tend to have a longer um, term commitments. Um, so maybe 90 days. Um, and that's maybe not as flexible, even though uh, as ours, even though you could subscribe for 90 days with ours. Um, but in terms of pricing, the average uh, pricing um, I mentioned the $699 starting for a Kona and $899 for the Ionic 5. Um, the average uh, monthly rate is about $1399 for the subscription services that we benchmark against um, and we view as compet our competitors. Um, so from that standpoint, we're really competitive. Um, the other thing, if you're taking it from a different lens, um, not necessarily as a consumer, this is a dealer-oriented um, program. So we are operating through our dealers, um, which we think, think makes a really big uh, deal in terms of dealer network engagement and buy-in. Um, and so those are the three kind of high level aspects I would point to as what makes us um, competitive. Okay, that's, that's awesome. Um, your answer kind of got me thinking about, um, um, you know, in terms of the, the relevancy of subscriptions in general, um, do you think that, um, applying this subscription idea to EVs in particular, you know, which as you point out, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a new and emerging area that a lot of people aren't familiar with yet and kind of want to get their feet wet, but not ready to totally commit. Um, do you think EVs are perhaps one of the keys to getting this subscription idea off the ground? I do think, um, because it functions as more than just a transportation tool, it functions also as an education tool. That is really, really helpful to the success of the program. I th also think the type of product that you put in really, if it resonates with customers or consumers, then that's another piece of it. But I do think that this program as an EV subscription service has just landed at the right time. 
Right, okay. Um, so I have a question for, for either one of you. Um, you know, Kristen, you had, uh, you had mentioned, you had talked about uh, you know, the Ionic 5 within the context of, of uh, Evolve Plus. Well, I'm seeing these vehicles everywhere. Um, Ionic 5s are all over the roads of uh, Southern California. Um, it's taken off very quickly. Um, it's been sweeping awards around the world, um, you know, seemingly as one uh, accolades from every automotive publication and uh, uh, journalist group out there. So what's the secret to its success? Why, uh, uh, why is the public and the media um, so taken by this vehicle compared, you know, there's a lot of good EV choices out there. What makes Ionic 5 so special? Uh, okay, let me, let me start and Kristen, please chime in. Uh, so one of the things, it's actually, I would say it's not one single thing. Uh, I think what makes Ionic 5 very successful is it does a lot of things very well, right? Uh, the styling, we're in a position right now, time frame where it's still somewhat important for an electric vehicle to stand out to some extent. People still like to be able to recognize that this car is not just a regular conventional car, it's still an EV. Now, obviously, you can go too far with that, but um, it, it seems that the Ionic 5 resonates very well with consumers who are looking for an EV, but want something a little bit different, but not too far out there, right? There's that aspect. Now, 10 years from now, I think the market will be very different, and it, it's going to be more of a car should just look like a car regardless of whether it's an EV or not, but we're not quite there yet. The other part of it is just some of the performance that it offers for the, the value. The fact that it can get up for over 300 mile range, the fact that it has very quick charging, um, the fact that it actually is very large on the inside. Um, I should mention, uh, over the last couple of years, when you ask people what are the main reasons or concerns for purchasing an EV, your main, you know, why wouldn't you? The top three things, and it's remained fairly constant throughout the last five years or so. One is price, one is um, the AER, the range, and the other one is has to do with how long it takes to charge. Uh, one of the things that Hyundai uh, set out to do with this platform is to enable, uh, have a 400, 800 volt uh, architecture, right? So that allows us to uh, be able to charge with DC fast charging uh, at up to 350 kilowatt uh, chargers, right? And that's why you can, you can basically get, I think it's 60 miles of range in five minutes. Um, when you think of it in terms of most commutes, or less than 30 miles, or, or I'd rather people drive less than 30 miles a day, then in five minutes, you basically have enough range for a day, two days even, right? And then now you start to think of this vehicle as, oh, I don't actually have to wait long periods of time. It's actually quite as convenient as a gas in the car. So charging is huge. Um, the other part has to do, of course, with infrastructure. Um, so we're partnering with Electrify America to uh, allow for free 30-minute sessions for two years at their uh, DC fast chargers. And Electrify America is purely uh, DC fast charging. Um, other aspects of the vehicle have to do with the convenience of the interior, you know, the fact that it actually is very, very big on the inside, despite uh, its size on the outside. I actually believe that it has a longer wheelbase than our Palisade, which is our large three-row SUV, right? Um, then, of course, there's things like ride, comfort, convenience, technology, things of that matter. So it's it all knows it's about the entire package, right? Uh, up until now, you could argue some cars have great range, but they're very expensive. Other cars look really cool, but they sacrifice on space. The Ionic 5 really is, 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 the, is kind of the, the whole package. Of it. The only thing that I would chime in um, as a personal, on a personal note is um, my husband was so taken with it that he sold his Tesla and we're waiting for our Ionic 5 to oh. arrive. And that's a big deal for us. <laughs> so... That's very, very cool. Very yeah. cool. And uh, I will also say, just to get back to um, Evolve Plus, to kind of bring it full circle, yeah. we actually have had this happen where um, we've had uh, customers that have ordered their Tesla, they're waiting, because of course it takes a while to get your product. Um, they've subscribed in our program, driven the vehicle, been so happy that they canceled their Tesla order, ordered an Ionic 5, continue their subscription service until their I new Ionic 5. Has, has arrived. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a reason that a lot of people are making that switch, not just my husband, because I work for the company. Right, right. Well, um, no, that's, uh, that's actually a great segue into my next question, which um, has a little bit, but a little bit to do with Tesla. Um, and, you know, this question is directed at either, either or both of you. Um, 
so you know i've i've uh i've driven you know all the evs out there i've also used all the various uh dc fast charge networks that are out there um you know when i've tested Tesla's, I've, you know, obviously used the supercharger network. And then when driving, you know, anything other than a Tesla, you know, used Electrify America, EVgo, you know, all, you know, all kinds of other, you know, all the variety of uh, uh, DC fast charging providers out there. Um, it's kind of clear that uh, Tesla's biggest USP, at least to me, is their supercharger network? It's a it's it's a closed ecosystem. It's really reliable and it has the most simple user interface. There's no app or anything. You just plug in and you know all the pertinent information shows up on the car screen and you know off and off you go. Um, now your partnership with Electrify America does help Hyundai EV owners have access to a large network of public charging stations, much as. Uh, Tesla owners with, with their own supercharger network. But there are some reports out there of Electrify America and some of the other competing charging providers uh, suffering from less than optimal charge reliability and some of the other problems. Um, you know, I've long maintained that uh, in order to really grow EVs, uh, the infrastructure is just as important as the cars themselves because the car the cars can be wonderful, but if there's no way to uh, you know reliably and quickly get the you know charge these things up, well then they become a lot less relevant. Um, so not su not to suggest that Hyundai should go to similar lengths as Tesla in developing their own charging network, um, but uh, what can automakers like Hyundai do to help bring that public charging experience? Closer to closer to Tesla's because that Tesla supercharger network, um, you know, when we talk to EV uh, customers, it comes up time and time again. That supercharger network seems to be such a strength for that brand. Uh, okay, maybe I'll start it off. So, uh, first of all, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, when I when I listed the top three kind of concerns that consumers have, um, among the top five. A public infrastructure is always there, right? Um, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but it's always top five. Um, and you may argue or think, why is that if at least early adopters, people who are currently buying these majority of them are charging at home, a lot of it has to do with just uh, security, right? It, people want to feel confident that if they're for some reason on a long road trip, for some reason they forgot to charge overnight, that they can secure charging and won't get stranded. Um, it's also very important for us um, as we do try to grow sales beyond the 6%, 7% to 20, 30, 40, 50%, we have to increase some relying consumers who are going to rely on public charging, right? And one thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is these vehicles at some point are going to enter the used car market. Used car buyers, um, they're not as likely to have a place to charge at home, right? They are much more likely to have to rely on public charging. So absolutely, public charging has to be, a, a, is a critical issue. Um, not only for for government and you know the states and such who are trying to grow the public networks, but also for OEMs. So I think it's fair to say that it's it is a concern and it's something that we monitor very closely. Now, for us, um, it's about making sure that the consumers have access to any and all public charging infrastructure and making it uh, convenient to them. In terms of you know you're you're able to see uh, stations on your head unit in the car, the navigation system, be able to know uh, what stations are available. And then of course, being able to connect to these stations seamlessly. Um, there's one uh, system called Plug and Charge, right? To make um, that system enables you to plug into a, a network without having to worry, uh, use a credit card or a card. Uh, so that certainly helps. But all that can only go so far. So what we're actually doing is we are uh, have a number of initiatives right now to improve third-party out-of-home charging experiences. I wish I could tell you a bit more about that, but we actually are looking at this. There are sort of things that we are actually engaged on to address this specific issue, but hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that in the future. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Kristen, do you have anything to add to that? Gil pretty much covered it. I think everything else is confidential. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, well, I'm glad, I'm very, I'm, Definitely glad to see that there is some uh, um, work behind the scenes being done in that regard. Uh, so that's uh, that's good to know. Very good to know. Um, so 
I've mentioned Ionic 5 and, you know, obviously it's, you know, it's turning out to be a huge success for you. Um, but uh, your future success in EVs uh, can't be um, dependent on this one model. Is it possible to talk a little bit about what's uh, coming down the line? What's, what's some other vehicle segments that you're thinking about getting into um, with electric uh, powertrains? Uh, that's a, that's that's, a Gail question. Yeah, that's a, that's one of those where you're like, well, where does Ed work? What, huh? What's Ed going to say to everyone? So we have <laughs> well, to be you, careful. You, you've got, you know, I, you know, I, you mentioned, you mentioned there's an Ionic Six that's going to be shown yep. at the Auto Show yep. at the LA Auto Show. Uh, you know, we've seen concepts of a larger yep. SUV. Can, uh, can you tell, uh, can you tell me and uh, our uh, and our audience about? You know what's some you know what are these vehicles? What's an Ionic Six? What's an, what's an Ionic Seven? And uh, what are they going to do in the EV marketplace? So um, let's let me try to approach it this way, without getting into specifics. Uh, ultimately, um, our goal is is to transition toward fully electrified, right? And at some point in time, that means that every vehicle will be a zero emission vehicle, be it a fuel cell or a pure battery electric uh, or plug-in hybrid. But let's let's focus just on battery electric for now. In order to be able to transition fully, that means that we have to target the segments where consumers are primarily focused on, right? If you look at what are the biggest segments, the segments happen to be SUV. And within SUV, the segments are what we internally call subcompact, which is Tucson uh, segment or something comparable to like a RAV4 or CRV, right? That's kind of where the Ionic 5 is. Then you look at what other segments are very key. Oh, midsize SUV, three row SUVs, like for us, it'd be Palisade or like a Pilot or a Highlander. That's actually where the Ionic 7 is intended to compete. So in terms of size, in terms of interior roominess, in terms of uh, cargo capability, the Ionic 7 is supposed to be a direct competitor and a direct option for those who are looking at a traditional uh, three-row mid-size SUV. What other segments are very popular? Actually, entry SUV. Oh, by the way, we have a Kona, right? Kona EV. Now, those are, and then of course you look at sedans. Now, unfortunately, I personally like cars very much, passenger cars, but the sedan segment continues to contract and there's not as much growth in that area. Not to say that consumers who do buy uh, sedans aren't also interested in EVs. In fact, sedan owners typically are a little bit more interested in EVs than actually SUV owners. And that's where the Ionic 7 comes in. The Ionic 7 is, I'm sorry, Ionic 6, the Ionic 6. The Ionic 6 is intended to bridge kind of between what we call a um, compact and midsize, between Elantra and Sonata, right? And so when you look at the size and capability of the vehicle, uh, it's closer in size to maybe a Sonata. Uh, but then at the same time, it it's also has a lot of versatility and it's uh, designed to have rear-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, uh, medium driving range, long range. Uh, in fact, a lot of these specs will probably be revealed in the very, very near future. Uh, so you've got your sedan market covered. Now beyond that, you know, you've got to look at what other segments uh, have high um, sales right? And are those segments right for uh, EV consideration? So we've seen our competitors show a lot of interest in pickup trucks. Pickup truck is one of the biggest segments out there, right? And obviously, there, we've seen a lot of interest on the full-size uh, EV offerings from Ford and others. Um, so there's that area, right? I'm not saying that we're entering that area, but obviously, if we were, that'd be something that we'd be interested in. What are, what are the pickup side for EVs? What are the other SUV segments that you know, show potential? And then finally, when you look at luxury, um, for us, it's if we're going to be fully electrified in luxury, that means that all our segments that we currently compete in right now, if we think that those segments will still be around by 2030, then obviously you need to show an electrified solution in that segment. Okay. Um, I've got some, uh, uh, got some uh, really good questions uh, from the audience here. So um these these questions uh, are directed to uh, either of you so either of uh, either of you who want to answer these questions so go for it so um uh you talked about uh the new manufacturing uh, facility that's uh, that's going to be in georgia um you know it's a it's a huge it's a huge undertaking uh you know hugely significant for the local economy there um can you tell me a little bit about what renewable energy is going to be used for that new manufacturing facilities production? Uh, I don't think we have the details on that just yet. Uh, it's something that uh, I myself personally don't know too much about. Uh, I think they're exploring a lot of different areas, be it solar, uh, be it um, 
using uh, biogas and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, I, I don't have uh, all the information. I don't know, Kristen, if you have anything more on that. I don't either. I think all options are on the table, but I would be surprised if solar wasn't a large piece of it. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, now, of course, uh, you've got all kinds of, uh, you know, these very aggressive e vehicles. It's very, it's very impressive. Um, and it looks like uh, you've set uh, a really awesome foundation to go down that path. Um, now, Hyundai is part of a larger Hyundai Motor Group. So you've got, you know, as far as automotive brands, you've got Genesis uh, as your luxury uh, brand, but there's also the Kia brand. Um, and Kia is like Hyundai, uh, a mainstream, non-premium, non-luxury brand. Um, how does Kia work into the overall Hyundai Motor Group's um, plans uh, to transition into uh, electrification? Kristen, you want to try? So I don't want to be. I don't want to be greedy. Oh, well, Hyundai Motor, sure. a corporate question as opposed to a brand question, I guess. Yes, I'm so sorry. Let me scroll to it. I just got an important email that popped up. I apologize. Um, which question is it again? Um, the question is uh, about. Uh, Oh, it disappeared from my. Sense. Oh, is it? These are the very aggressive EV goals. Well done. How does Kia work into that? Yes. yes. Ah, um, yes. That's that's a really good question. Um, so, so Kia is. <clears throat> you have to understand a little bit about um, our relationship with Kia in North America versus our relationship with Kia in Korea. Um, <clears throat> in Korea, we we operate as a legal entity, kind of under the same umbrella. And so here that is not the case, um, which is a little bit unusual. So, so the perception here in the U.S. is that we, we may be the same company, at least from regulators' viewpoints and things of that nature. But we actually operate completely separately. We're competitors. Um, and so when we talk, uh, when Gil and I talk about um, our electrification goals here in North America, it is as Hyundai Motor America. Um, not to include Kia. So they have their own goals. When we're talking about Hyundai Motor Group's goals, um, or let's say their car Hyundai Motor Group's carbon neutrality goals, um, that would include Kia because that's being uh, spearheaded by our parent company that owns both of us back in Seoul. Um, mm -hmm. So I hope that that helps clarify. But it's a wonderful question and it's one we get often. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, I don't really think of aviation when I think of Hyundai, but clearly over the last few years, uh, Hyundai has uh, made some very exciting announcements uh, regarding getting into the e-VTOL space. Uh, so I have a question from the audience uh, regarding that. Um, what is, how does the timeline look for e-VTOL infrastructure and regulation for logistics and people transportation purposes? Yeah, e VTOL, so uh, VTOL is vertical takeoff and landing, right? So um, that is certainly a, an area of exploration for Hyundai and I think a lot of other uh, organizations. When you look at um, the focus here is maybe kind of city hopping, right? It's kind of like not long distance, but short distance. Just think of it as aerial taxi. Um, and there's certainly, and, and with the advent of powerful electric motors and hopefully higher energy densities for batteries, or at least for our case also, the exploration of fuel cell powered EV toll. Um, you know, that, that enables uh, kind of a new area that, you know, five, 10 years ago was not possible. But uh, certainly it's an unexplored area, not only from a manufacturer standpoint, but also from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and a lot of things have to fall in place before any of this is ever going to materialize. Um, I think maybe the first step is going to be something more of kind of delivery, smaller smaller EV toll where it's not so much passenger, but it's more cargo. And then kind of we migrate more into passenger. But these strategies that we're working on uh, EV toll, um, they're clearly not something that you're gonna see around the corner and not in a couple of years, but you're gonna see much closer in more of a 2030 timeframe, I think. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, but you... if, I can just, if I can just add, but I think it's important to recognize that um, one of the strengths of the Hyundai Group right now is to be able to have that long-term vision, because I think there's a recognition that a lot of things, a lot of these projects, a lot of these areas aren't going to have a quick turnaround, but they're long-term investments that um, will pay off 
in the future, but also we'll be able to to um, take advantage of these huge structural changes that we're seeing in, in our societies. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, kind of thinking about going back to, uh, going getting back to the ground and uh, electric cars in particular. Uh, another question we have from the audience, are electric cars the solution for a less polluting transportation or is it a step along the way? Do you want me to take the first bite at that one? Okay, so it's a really good question. Um, tra the transportation system, um, as you may know, uh, comprises, at least in the state of California, um, and I would venture a guess, but I'd need to confirm uh, probably the US, uh, the, largest, um, the largest segment um, of emissions. And so there are a lot of components to the transportation system. It includes rail, it includes heavy duty, it includes light duty cars, um, it includes buses. Um, it, it's vast. And so the short answer is we're one piece, but we're a really big piece mm -hmm. because of the just kind of raw number of vehicles that are out there that are being driven. Um, and so being able to have that many um, light duty passenger vehicles that are clean makes a really, really big impact, which is why um, state and federal regulatory agencies prioritize cleaning these vehicles. You may know that the state of California recently in August um, adopted 100% um, zero emission vehicle target by 2035 model year, which essentially means 2034 and calendar year, and a 2034 calendar year. Um, and that's because these vehicles are such a massive source um, of uh, both smog forming and greenhouse gas uh, pollutants. Okay. I, would, oh. I would also just say regarding the other, those other sectors, um, or not, I wouldn't say sectors, other um, sources that we talked about, um, there are regulations that are also in play for them. Um, I believe there's an advanced clean truck rule that the state of California is putting out with a similar sort of mandate. I think it's 2040 or 2045. Mm -hmm. um, and so these, these particular sources, I mean, they're, they're, um, they're combustion engines. So of course they're dirty. It's really important to the state of California and the California and the state of California in this space tends to lead um, and the federal government tends to follow uh, what California does. Um, so, so if ever you're, you're more curious about this, you can always go to the California Air Resources Board's website and learn about what they're doing in terms of all, like the entire transportation sector. But light duty is a very, very big piece um, and they're accelerating those reductions very quickly with the recent passage of um, what's called the Advanced Clean Cars uh, 2 rule. Okay. All right. Um, I have a final question for the both of you. Um, Hyundai definitely is at the forefront of, of future mobility as we've learned uh, through this session. Um, and it seems like a, you know any company that is in, you know, at the forefront of these areas um, must be a very dynamic place to work. So if, I'm, if I was a student now, what suggestions would you have uh, for someone who wants a career at Hyundai in a field like what you two are working in? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I, I come from a, long automotive background, you know, as you mentioned, Toyota and then Honda and such. And so I guess automotive is all I've ever known. For me, it's the passion of working with cars and just liking this area. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, the, the further you go along, the fewer and fewer people who I would say are automotive diehards or like they're passionate about it. Um, and, and that is quite okay, right? I think um, there are new areas that uh, auto manufacturers are entering that aren't, like we just been talking about, that aren't strictly um, cars and trucks, um, new areas of mobility. And so I think that someone who is interested in these areas, someone who's interested in a company like Hyundai, um, one doesn't have to be a, a gearhead. One, one basically uh, could be interested very much in just environmental issues. One could be just interested in different mobility solutions, <laughs> like Kristen, <laughs> yep. uh, right? And then, and then there's also just the dynamic nature of this industry, right? Um, it, it goes through highs and lows. Um, 
but it's never a dull moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and especially now, right now, the industry is facing so many changes in terms of regulations, in terms of consumer changing um, trends, right? Younger consumers is less interested in driving, things of that nature. Um, it makes it very challenging. And if you like being challenged, if you like uh, needing to come up with new solutions to address problems that 10 years ago never existed, then, then Hyundai is actually a very interesting place to work at. Awesome. Kristen, do you have any advice? Yeah, I would echo that. My path into Hyundai was a little less traditional. Um, I was a practicing attorney, an environmental attorney, um, and wanted to make an impact and felt that um, working in regulatory strategy on the environmental side um, would be really meaningful work. Um, And it has been, it's also given me the opportunity to get into business. And no one in my family um, was ever really in business strategy or things of that nature. And so I had no one to inform me about how interesting it is. And it just so happened that I came in to do regulatory work, which I still do, but I'm also doing Um, business work with this Evolve Plus program, and I'm finding how fascinating it is. And the last thing I would say about Hyundai is if you have a lot of autonomy to pursue things uh, that interest you here. And so in addition to your, your job, you know, day in and day out, if you're curious about things, we have programs that help you um, facilitate that and explore those things Gil runs one of them um, called the Big Idea Generator. And this is run a couple times every year where associates can, um, you know, submit these big ideas that they have to make our company better, more competitive, um, innovative. And this is, and and our our parent company thinks that like they're very supportive of this um, program. And it's actually, Hyundai Home is a perfect example. That's where it came from, uh, was this particular big idea generator um, process. And so I just think that the company welcomes innovation. It welcomes curious minds. So if you have that sort of personality, it's a great fit for you. All right, thank you both. Um, with that, um, and, and thank you both, uh, Kristen. Thank you, Gil. Um, this has been awesome. Um, I'd like to uh, hand, uh, hand the baton back to uh, Professor Peck um, with some closing statements. Thank you so much uh, for moderating such an intriguing conversation with Gil and Christine. <clears throat> thank you so much, Gil and Christine, for talking to the LME community today out of your very busy schedule. Uh, we really appreciate sharing with us your insights into this important and timely topic. Your presentation was very informative and enlightening. I'd like to congratulate on your business success. My daughter is driving Ionic 5, and I know it is an awesome car, just like that, you know, you mentioned about your husband. Uh, my daughter and my uh, son-in-law also sold Tesla, and they bought Ionic 5. Um, <clears throat> And actually that, uh, if you do not mind, I think that uh, just one final quick question, all this great plan is successfully implemented. Um, I feel like that they, once you purchase a Hyundai car, you probably don't have to purchase another one for a long period of time. So I wonder how you coordinate your product development strategy with a global marketing strategy. Anyone? <laughs> Uh, that's a very interesting question and a difficult one to answer. So one thing is, as an example, Hyundai's brand position and image in Korea is very different than its position and brand image in the U.S. And so um, the Korean market, they're obviously Hyundai is the dominant car brand in Korea. And right. it has a, kind of a very strong position there. And so when you do marketing there, it's coming from a dominant, you know, stronghold. Here in the U.S., we're not a dominant brand, right? We're still kind of a challenger brand, if you will. And so when you look at marketing, how we target people, it has to come under that light. Um, and then in Europe, obviously, there, there are different positions where the Hyundai brand is. Um, but it also um, means, for example, electrification growth and strategy is different for the U.S. Uh, Korea is very similar, but, for example, in China or Europe, very different strategies, right? And so that also has to be uh, different. So I guess bottom line is that um, even though we're one global company, I think there is a lot of autonomy within all the regions, 
right? Because the goals and the position and what we've set out to do is slightly different uh, right. region by region. Okay. Um, well, finally, I'd like to thank all of you, our audience who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program and learned a lot about Hyundai's electrification strategy. We'll be back with another exciting program on Thursday, November 17th. The upcoming webinar is titled Living the Dream as a Digital Nomad. This will be a great program for anyone who's considering pursuing your career in international business and management. Um, lastly, when you leave this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey. I really appreciate it if you can complete it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much that uh, our panelists and um, I think that this was a great program. <laughs>